Hello, welcome to your Unit 3 Articulate file. This lecture will review heart anatomy as well as a review of the fetal circulatory system and changes at birth. As always, if you have any questions regarding this material, you should ask your instructor for clarification. This section is going to be an anatomical review of the heart and the cardiovascular system, and I encourage you to pick up a good anatomy book and read the chapter on the heart as well as reading Chapter 9 in Guyton and Hall. The cardiovascular system is composed of the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. The pulmonary circuit takes blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs and back to the left side of the heart. The systemic circuit pumps blood from the left side of the heart through systemic vessels and peripheral tissues and back to the right side of the heart. It is important to remember that the vessels called arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Vessels called veins always carry blood toward the heart. This is their strictest definition. You do not want to say all arteries carry oxygenated blood because this is not always the case. Again, you should learn that arteries are vessels that carry blood away from the heart and veins are vessels that carry blood toward the heart. The heart is a relatively small organ, roughly the size of your clenched fist. The heart is located left of the body midline, posterior to the sternum, in the middle of the mediastinum. The heart is rotated such that its right side, or border, is located more anteriorly, while its left side, or border, is located more posteriorly. The posterior superior surface of the heart formed primarily by the left atrium is called the base. Putting this another way, the widest portion of the heart is its superior portion and this is called the base. The inferior conical end is called the apex. It projects slightly anterior, inferiorly toward the left side of the body. The base is also roughly found inferior to the second rib and the apex is roughly found between the fifth and sixth rib, and the heart rests on top of the diaphragm. The heart is contained within the pericardium, a fibrous serous sac. This pericardium restricts heart movement so it doesn't bounce around and move about in the thoracic cavity, generating friction. Friction generates heat, and heat denatures proteins. The pericardium is composed of two parts. The outer portion is a tough, dense, connective tissue layer called the fibrous pericardium. This layer is attached to the diaphragm and the base of the heart. The inner portion is a thin, double-layer serous membrane called the serous pericardium, and this serous pericardium is divided into two layers. There is a parietal layer of serous pericardium that lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium and a visceral layer that surrounds the surface <coughs> of the heart. This is also called the epicardium and I'll talk about that in a bit. The parietal and visceral layers are continuous with each other and are attached to the great vessels. The thin space between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium is called the pericardial cavity. The serosal fluid, as I mentioned before, protects the heart by acting as a lubricant. It reduces the amount of friction generated as the heart beats. The heart wall consists of three distinctive layers, an external epicardium, a middle myocardium, and an internal endocardium. As I said before, the epicardium and visceral layer of the serous pericardium are synonyms, that is, they are the same structure. The myocardium is the middle layer of the heart wall and is composed of cardiac muscle tissue. The myocardium is the thickest of the three heart layers. The internal surface of the heart and the external surfaces of the heart valves are covered by endocardium. The endocardium is composed of a simple squamous epithelium called an endothelium. Here is a labeled picture of the heart. Let's start with blood returning to the right side of the heart. Shown here are the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. They are bringing deoxygen, deoxygenated blood back to the right side of the heart. The superior vena cava is bringing blood from the upper limbs and head 
and the inferior vena cava is bringing blood from the remainder of the body. The deoxygenated blood then travels or enters the, into the right atrium. When the atria contract, the blood will be pumped through the right atrioventricular valve, which is inside the heart. I'll show you a picture of that later. Into the right ventricle. When the ventricles contract, the blood is then pumped into the pulmonary trunk. This is an artery. Although it carries deoxygenated blood, or oxygen-poor blood, it is still an artery because this vessel is carrying blood away from the heart. The pulmonary trunk bifurcates into the right and left pulmonary arteries. These vessels will ultimately lead to capillary beds within the lungs where oxygenation can occur. When the blood has become fully saturated with oxygen, it now returns to the heart using the left and right pulmonary veins. Again, although these vessels are carrying oxygen-rich blood, they are carrying the blood back toward the heart. Therefore, they are veins. The blood then enters the left atrium. When the atria contract, the blood will be pumped through the left atrioventricular valve, and the blood enters the left ventricle. When the ventricles contract, the oxygenated blood will now travel into the aorta. This is now <clears throat> the beginning of the systemic circuit. The oxygenated blood will now be pumped to all the peripheral tissue capillary beds. The right atrium receives venous blood from the systemic circuit and the heart muscle itself. Three major vessels empty into the right atrium. The superior vena cava drains blood from the, heart, from the head, neck, upper limbs, and superior regions of the trunk. The inferior vena cava drains blood from the lower limbs and trunk and the coronary sinus drains blood from the heart wall. The interatrial septum forms a thin wall between the right and left atria. The posterior atrial wall is smooth, but the anterior atrial wall exhibits obvious muscular ridges called pectinate muscles. When one looks at the interatrial septum, there appears to be an oval depression called the fossa ovalis. It occupies the former location of the fetal foramen ovale, which shunted blood from the right atrium to the left atrium during fetal life, as will be described later on in this PowerPoint. The opening that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle is covered by a valve called the right atrioventricular valve, also called the tricuspid valve, since it has three triangular flaps. Oxygen-poor blood flows through the right atrium through the right atrioventricular opening when the valve is open and into the right ventricle. The right AV valve is forced close when the right ventricle begins to contract, preventing blood from backflowing into the right atrium. Like the right atrium, the left atrium also has pectinate muscles along its anterior wall as well as an auricle. An auricle is a wrinkled flap, a wrinkled flap-like extension of the atrium. Separating the left atrium from the left ventricle is an opening that is covered by the left atrioventricular valve, also called the bicuspid valve, since it has two triangular cusps. This valve is also sometimes called the mitral valve, since the two triangular cusps represent a mitre, a headpiece worn by a bishop. The left AV valve has cordi tendinii, similar to those of the right AV valve. These cordi tendinii will be discussed further in a later PowerPoint slide. Oxygenated blood flows from the left atrium through the atrioventricular opening when the valve is open and into the left ventricle. The left AV valve is forced closed when the left ventricle begins to contract, preventing blood from backflowing into the left atrium. Let's review. There are three major vessels returning oxygen-poor blood to the right atrium. They are the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Blood vessels leading to the left atrium are the left and right pulmonary veins. These are carrying oxygen-rich blood back to the left atrium. An interventricular septum forms a thick wall between the right and left ventricles. The internal wall surface of each ventricle displays characteristic large, smooth, irregular muscular ridges called the trabeculae carnii.
There are also projections called papillary muscles that anchor the thin strands of collagen fibers called cordy tendinii. These cordy tendinii attach to the lower surface of the cusps from the right and left atrioventricular valves and prevent the AV valves from everting and flipping into the atrium when the ventricles are contracting. At its superior end, the right ventricle narrows into a smooth walled conical region called the conus arteriosus. Beyond the conus arteriosus is the, is the pulmonary semilunar valve, which marks the end of the right ventricle and the entrance to the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries, which carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs. The left ventricle, when it contracts, will push blood through the aortic semilunar valve, which cannot be seen in this picture. Lastly, I want to point out that the myocardium surrounding the left ventricle is extremely thick. This reflects the greater force that the left ventricle generates in order to push blood out into the systemic circuit. Here is a superior view of all four cardiac valves. We see the right and left atrioventricular valves which cover the openings that lead from the atria into the ventricles. We also see <clears throat> the aortic semilunar valve and the pulmonary semilunar valve. I want to tell you that the reason why these valves open is not due to muscle contraction. Rather, these valves open due to pressure changes or differences across these membranes. I also want you to know that these valves do not close due to direct muscle contraction. The aortic and pulmonary semilunar valve will close when the heart begins to rest. Students often think that the papillary muscles attached to the cordae tendinii of the AV valves are the ones that are responsible for closing the valves or even opening them. Again, muscle contraction directly acting on these valves does not lead to the opening or closure of these valves. They open and close due to blood pressure differences across these membranes. And you will learn about this in lecture. The atria are separated from the, from the ventricles externally by a relatively deep coronary sulcus that extends around the circumference of the heart. On both the anterior and posterior surfaces of the heart, there are sulci located between the right and left ventricles. These sulci extend inferiorly from the coronary sulcus towards the heart apex. All sulci house blood vessels that supply the heart, which I would like to now address. Left and right coronary arteries travel in the coronary sulcus of the heart to supply the heart wall. These arteries are the only branches of the ascending aorta. The openings of these arteries are located immediately superior to the aortic semilunar valve just behind the cusps. The right coronary artery branches into the right marginal artery which supplies the right border of the heart and the posterior interventricular artery which supplies both the right and left ventricles. The left coronary artery branches into the anterior interventricular artery which supplies the anterior surface of both ventricles and most of the interventricular septum and the circumflex artery which supplies the left atrium and ventricle. This arterial pattern can vary greatly among individuals. The coronary arteries are considered to be functional end arteries. In other words, while the left and right coronary arteries share some tiny connections called anastomoses, functionally they act like end arteries and lead to capillary beds. Venous return occurs through one of several cardiac veins. <clears throat> the great cardiac vein runs alongside the anterior interventricular artery. The middle cardiac vein runs along the posterior interventricular artery and the small cardiac vein travels alongside the right marginal artery. These cardiac veins all drain into the coronary sinus, a large vein that lies in the posterior aspect of the coronary sulcus. The coronary sinus drains directly into the right atrium of the heart, 
these two pictures show you coronary arteries and the veins separately. If you took these two pictures and superimposed them on each other, you would see how the coronary arteries and the coronary veins actually travel together in all of the coronary sulci, the anterior interventricular sulcus and the posterior interventricular sulcus. <clears throat> Let's review blood flow through both the pulmonary and systemic circuit. Let's begin with oxygen-poor blood arriving in the right atrium. The three major blood vessels bringing back this deoxygenated blood are the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Blood flows into the right atrium. When the atria contract, the blood is pushed through the opening separating the right atrium from the right ventricle. This opening is covered by the right atrioventricular valve or tricuspid valve. When the ventricles contract, the blood will now be pushed through the pulmonary semilunar valve and the blood enters a large artery called the pulmonary trunk. This marks the beginning of the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary trunk will bifurcate into the right and left pulmonary arteries. The blood will then enter capillary beds within the lung tissues. Gas exchange will occur in the lungs and the blood will return to the left atrium through the right and left pulmonary veins. Again, this is still part of the pulmonary circuit. The blood enters the left atrium and blood flows through the mitral valve and enters the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, blood will be pushed through the aortic semilunar valve and the blood will enter the aorta. The aorta branches into peripheral vessels and peripheral capillary beds in the system and this basically constitutes the systemic circuit. When the tissues of the body have been oxygenated, then the blood will return to small venules to larger veins and ultimately leads back to the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava, or coronary sinus. Let's walk through the steps of blood flowing through the heart. Blood returning to the heart fills the atria, <clears throat> putting pressure on the atrioventricular valves. This blood pressure opens the AV valves. When the valves open, the blood can now rush into the ventricles and the ventricles fill. Most of ventricular filling is a passive process. As the atria contract, they will force additional blood into the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, they, push, they start pushing on the blood inside of it, and this starts to generate enough pressure to close the AV valves. The atrioventricular valves are closing because the ventricular musculature is starting to generate more pressure inside and this pushes the blood upward. The increased blood pressure is what closes the AV valves. The atrioventricular valves are not closing due to papillary muscle contraction. Papillary muscles contract and cordy tendony tighten in order to prevent valve flaps from everting into the atria. As the ventricles contract and intraventricular pressure rises, blood is pushed up against semilunar valves, forcing them open. As the ventricles relax and intraventricular pressure falls, blood flows back from arteries, filling the cusps of semilunar valves and forcing them to close. There are four normal heart sounds. The heart sounds are caused by the turbulent flow of blood and the vibrations of the heart valves. Heart sound 1 occurs when the blood is pushed superiorly during ventricular contraction, causing the AV valves to close. All four valves are closed and the blood and ventricular walls vibrate from the mounting pressure. Heart sound 2 occurs when the ventricles relax and there is a momentary backflow of blood from the aorta and pulmonary trunk. This backflow fills the semilunar valve cusps and closes them. The blood then sloshes back and forth on top of these valves, creating sound. Heart sound 3 occurs from venous return during diastole. The atrial blood pressure is greater than ventricular pressure and the blood pours into the ventricles, creating sound from the turbulent blood flow. Heart sound 4 occurs when the atria contract 
and push extra blood into the ventricles.